All right, so I think that we're about ready. <coughs> it's amazing how when you plug a computer into a laptop, I mean a computer into a projector, it starts acting completely differently. But I think we're there. So uh, my name's Simon Lees. I work for CESA. And today I'm going to talk to you about robots, which is a hobby, something I've done in my spare time for well, I used to do in my spare time and I've had a bit less time of late, but okay. So I've been working at SUSE for a bit over a year. Um, before that, I worked for a communications company in an engineering department. So I got to have some exposure to electronics and um, things like that. And I've been a member of the, uh, I've been working in the Open SUSE project for five plus years, but it's the first time I've been able to come across to the conference being from Australia. And so, so this is a tr big trap, and you have all been talked into coming to a boring systems engineering lecture with the promise of shiny robots and things. Um, so you have been warned. Run away now if you wish. But so yeah. Um, where do I go next? So I want to talk to you about. There's a lot of in open source. There's a lot we can learn from systems engineering concepts in that you can, there's a whole bunch of stuff that people have already made for you and you can take it, you can use it, you can do what you want with it. And often enough when we go to start a project, we think I'll just write everything from scratch whereas the system engineer in me should goes, well, no, you shouldn't just write everything from scratch. You should go and look at what's already there and see if you can be lazy and use the least amount of effort possible to bring all these things together. So why would we make a robot? Well, because we can and they're cool. And most software I write is boring and sits in the bottom of a server and you never get to see anything and it doesn't look cool. Whereas these people look at it and they go, it's cool and it's fun. So that's why we write a robot. and. The second reason is because the world needs more cool robots. That should be obvious. When I was a kid, we had a talk at, I think, a scout group from a local robotics club, and that would have been back in the early 90s. And the robots then were pretty underwhelming, I thought. they It was a box that looked nicely like a robot, but all it could do was flash some LEDs. And to me, that's not a robot. That's a box with flashing lights. When I think robot, I think something like R2-D2, something that's cool, something that's got voice activation, something that's able to drive itself around, and all those sorts of things. So that's where I started with my design for my robot and where I wanted to take it. That's, so having said that for the design, why would you make a robot running Linux? And there is a lot of advantages, really. You already have text-to-speech, speech-to-text applications. Um, sound is easy. Video is easy. You have Wi-Fi to get it to talk to a bunch of things easily. And Linux is good for developing on. It's easy to write a Linux application and to do what you want. So that's why if you were to, write a, if you were to make a robot, you might want to use Linux to do it. And so... But there is downsides to using Linux for a robot. Real-time operations, toggling wires to go up and down when you want them to can be painful. It can be done, but it can be painful. So going with this concept of systems engineering, finding the right thing for the right task, taking the laziest approach possible. I have something called an Arduino, which is a little microprocessor, and I decided I'd use that to do all the controlling of motors because that's what they're designed for. And I thought I'd talk to it with serial because serial is easy. But we'll go further. Now, something I find and something that held me back from starting this project a lot longer ago is hard. I'm not a mechanical engineer. I can't really fabricate cool things and so I wanted to find something out there that I could use. And at the time, I'd been looking for ages 
and I wanted something with tank tracks, but everything with tank tracks was like this big, plasticky, didn't look like it would survive outside anyway. And so being s someone who wanted a cool robot that could drive around and go fast, I was thinking of taking a RC car about this big and building my robot on top of that. And then one day I was looking around on eBay and I saw someone had started making these robot chassis and that was really what kick-started me actually working on this project was something became available and I think, for those of you at the back, let's try this. Here I have a dodgy camera that's, and if I can aim it correctly, you'll be able to see. So basically we've got a chassis with a couple of tank tracks. And so now that, so now that I realized that the cool part was there, the hard part was done, I could start thinking a bit more about the design, which I'd already thought about a bit in my head. And so now we come to the design part of the talk. Um, and while hardware is really hard, electronics is not the hardest thing in the world, but still, I'm lazy and um, I could build electronics things, but that would take me a long time and would probably be a waste of my time. So I worked out I had um, three main problems to solve with regards to the electronics. This chassis came with a couple of 12 volt motors and so I needed to come up with a way to power the motors, a way to control the motors and then in my ideal world I didn't want to have two power sources connected so I wanted to power my processor off the same thing I'm using to power my motors. So those were my three challenges. The first solution for providing the power isn't here today because it is a big lithium battery and airlines don't like you taking them on planes. So to make my life easier, I just left it at home. But I'm using a 11.4 volt, I think it's a 5,000 milliamp hour battery that was I think designed for RC planes or something like that, it's about this long, this wide. And at the time I didn't know how much power I needed and I was lazy and I didn't bother doing any calculations. I just bought the biggest battery I could find that was about the right voltage and hoped for the best. And I was quite surprised because it will happily run the robot running around for five or six hours with the processor running with a webcam going and all sorts of things. So that was a big plus. Um, in terms of controlling the motor, I did some Googling and there is a thing called a H-bridge, which is what this top picture is. And as I said, I could have sat down and I could have designed a circuit for that chip and built it myself, but in reality, you can buy one for $5 off eBay. So I picked the nicest looking one I could find and it's sitting somewhere under here. And then again, I knew there was a thing called a voltage regulator, which takes your 12 volts and turns it into five volts. And so I found one of them as well. Um, let's have a, yeah, that was, so you can see from the camera up here, there is this thing on the right with a, display that you can't quite see in the light, it says 12.1 at the moment and you can get much smaller ones but I try. I decided to get one with a display on it because you can see how much bat power the battery is putting out and so you know when to charge your battery which is pretty useful. So now we have the solution to the electronics um, problems, I had to choose processors. Now this was back two and a half years ago when I started this and while the Raspberry Pis had been out, they weren't, I think it was still only the Raspberry Pi 1 at that time, 
wasn't good value compared to something like the Odroid. So I went with an Odroid C1, which is pictured below. It's hiding so it's hiding under this display here. And then in hindsight, that was a really bad choice. Because if you're ever going to buy an ARM board, buy one where the company is upstreaming the drivers into the mainline kernel. Because for example, this process, this board is running a Ubuntu 3.2 kernel, because that was the kernel it had at the time, and no one has ever updated it since. And running alongside that, because I wanted to run OpenSUSE on it, it is running an OpenSUSE factory snapshot probably from about two years ago, which like all great Internet of Things devices, means it's quite insecure. Um, and I haven't tried updating it because I know we probably use newer features in the kernel and it will probably break. One of the next things on my list is to replace it with a Raspberry Pi 3 where things will just work out of the box. So that's somewhere where I didn't take the simple option and it's come back to bite me. Um, and then in terms of the Arduino, which I talked about before, it's this little microprocessor you can see up the top. I picked this nice little whiteboard that just slots onto the um, GPI header of the Raspberry Pi or Odroid, and that makes life easy because it's also powered from the Odroid, which is one less thing that I need to worry about. And my advice for anyone, if you ever buy an ARM board, is get one of those serial adapters. It will save your life multiple times because if you start if you start up your board and you don't get to network, if you don't have one of those cables, you have no way of knowing what is going on. Whereas if you plug the cable in, you get a nice terminal interface. You can see what's wrong and you can fix your problems. And you can come to somewhere, you can plug it in, you can configure a new Wi-Fi network and life's easy. So I have always been a great one for I will think I'm going to build a project, I will start doing the project, I'll see something else, I'll get distracted and I'll go work on something else and the first project was gone. So rather than spending lots of money up front and having all the parts for a robot but never actually building a robot. I sort of staged out my build over a few months. And so my first step was to buy the processor and get it working. And once I had invested the time into that, I knew I'd probably go to the next step. So I brought a motor and a bunch of electronics. Um, and then I wrote some code to make the motor work and then I added the chassis and then a battery. Um, you can see there, there is a list of things that are yet to be done that's next on my list. Um, would be nice if this webcam streamed to the device you're using to drive it so you can see where it's going. Um, because at the moment this doesn't know where it is, which way it's facing, so I need to add a GPS and a compass. And as you'll see a bit in a bit, the user interface I've written took me about an hour and could certainly do it with some improvements. And hey, maybe one day it can learn Skynet and it can drive itself around and it can do anything you'd want, but that's all just time, right? So coming into the design, um, I wanted to design this concept so that it was nice and modular. So basically the way it works is starting from the left. I have a, um, oh, I'm gonna start from the right. So, as I talked about, there's motors. They're driven by the motor controller. Um, and then the motor controller in turn, these are just plain four wires between zero and 12 volts. If it's zero volts, the motor doesn't go anywhere. If it's 12, they go full speed. Then the Arduino drives the motor controller. Mm -hmm. 
Coming over here, the Odroid talks via serial to the Arduino. And then I'm using Wi-Fi and WebSockets to c control it from either my laptop or a phone or whatever else. Um, and so for those of you who might want to build a robot but aren't sure, maybe I can give you enough information about how you could start. The Arduino code is remarkably simple. So this motor controller uses something called PWM to um, control the speed. So you send a um, square wave, as you can see here, and if it's zero, and if the, the shorter the high point is, the slower it'll go. And so on Arduino, there is hardware for that, and so all you have to do is write the right value, call the right function, and that'll happen automatically. So for each motor, we have the speed, which is running through one wire, and then we have a forwards and a backwards direction wire. You set the speed to something, you turn on the forwards wire, and it will drive something. And so, and I have the Arduino code. It's quite simple, so we could probably have a look at it. So each wire comes out of a pin. To start with, we tell it which pins to use for what. So we have one for reverse and forwards, and one for speed for the left motor, same for the right motor. Um, I've marked out the serial pins. And so, I also have some other things happening on the iDroid, which means I can't use these ones, so I made note of that as well. And then you set it up by saying that these, these pins here are outputs, and I've set the speed to zero. Can I make the text bigger? That is a wonderful question. Let's see. Is that go a bit bigger? Is that better? So this whole the whole code sitting on the microprocessor to drive the motors is two hundred and forty lines and it has some extra bits. Um so it's not complicated. This Arduino language, I'm using string stuff which isn't the fastest way of doing things on a microprocessor, but this doesn't need to run thousands of times a second, so it's easy and it works. Um, so we, the, you have a starting loop. Um, I, send a, I send a command across the serial, which looks something like, I'm just going to write it here because I left it out of the slide. So if you send this across serial, it will set both motors to be going at a speed of 80 out of 100. If you put a negative in front of it, then it will go backwards. And so this first lot of code is all around splitting up and pulling the speed out of that string. And then the interesting bit is here where we write the motor speed. And so if it's if the motor should be off or um then it sets the forwards pin to zero, it sends the backwards pin to zero. At the direction pins they can either be zero or one. In this case they're both set to zero. And then um, if the speed's set higher than zero, it's as simple as 
setting the right direction and then this analog right function is what makes the PW, PWM square wave thing and that takes between 0 and 255 and so we just calculate that and set that and then the motor will go. So the Arduino code is quite simple, it's on my GitHub. You could probably buy an Arduino, a motor controller, um, make sure you've got your pins, your cables set to the right spots, you might have to change. You might have to change the definitions here to point to the um, pins you're using. You could put that on your Arduino and you would have some code that you could run a motor from a serial device. It's not hard, so robotics can be quite simple. So, yep, there is the link. All right, and then the final part of the wire of the design in terms of electronics is the wiring. And as you can see, there's 12 volts going from the battery or the power supply cable as I've got today. And that goes to the motor controller. So the motors can be driven at 12 volts and it goes to the vo voltage regulator, which creates the five volts, which then the iDroid, the iDroid and the motor controller also use. Um, now, the next systems engineering component I wanted to talk to you about is modular design. You don't make one big monolithic thing you split things up into components. And so if we come back to the way data flows across here, I've used, I'm using Wi-Fi, Ethernet. It's very flexible, you can do anything with it. And then I thought, well, I don't want to write my own um, networking protocol to deal with this myself. I remembered there's this wonderful thing, thing called WebSockets. And with WebSockets, Every language has a library. You can run them from your browser in JavaScript, so I could get my web browser to control this robot if I wanted. And it's as simple as just sending a command, sending some text, and it'll come out the other end. And so by being modular and using WebSockets, I could control this from my laptop, my phone, anything else in the world. I could write my user interface part in whichever language I feel like, it could be JavaScript and a web page, it could be C++, it's easy, I have lots of options. And then if we take this whole component from here, by using serial, theoretically I could swap out the motor controller, the motors for something different, and I could change the chassis to be something like this. And using the same controller code, I could drive one of these around, which I would like to do one day if I have the spare money to afford something like that because I think that would be a lot of fun and would be the next step up from this. Um, all right. And so I'm not sure how many of you are programmers, how many of you have done a bit of scripting, but something I've found is that a lot of your more beginner hobbyist programmers, if you're used to just writing shell scripts, you could write a shell script that writes to the serial port to control this robot if you wanted to. Um, but a lot of people think of a, prog a program as something that has a starting point, it does a bunch of instructions and comes to an end point. Um, whereas with embedded systems, because we're dealing with events coming in, programs don't look like that. They look more like this is the, this is the main part of my robot app here. Um, and it is basically a while troop loop or while true loop. And so it sits there, it wakes up, it checks if some things have happened. If something's happened, it does something about it. If nothing's happened, it goes back to sleep and wakes up again. And so I, being a software engineer, and the software part being the fun part of the robot, the Python code that's running on the microcontroller is really over complex. And so I won't bother explaining it properly, other than we have what you call what we call threads. You can kind of think of them as spinning loops. So there is a spinning loop here. You can see from there, there is a spinning loop coming from the UI. So that's something that's waiting for 
it's sitting, your, proce your processor can do multiple things at once or have the illusion of doing things at once. So its whole job is to see if the UI has centered anything from the WebSocket. And if it does, it puts it into a queue so that this main thing can do it. But that's possibly getting a bit complex for some of you and that's okay. Um, so let's do some demoing. Um, so this is the robot. This is my phone. My phone has a smartphone app on it. I'll show you that in a minute, but I can theoretically press a button and things will work. So I have used Qt to write the Android application and one of the great advantages of that is I can also compile a desktop version. So at the moment my limited UI that I made in about an hour is four but five buttons. Forwards goes forwards. Backwards goes backwards. And you can see how fast it's going. And unfortunately there's not too far I can drive it around here, but we can have a shot. And so it'll drive around. And if it goes any further than that, it'll run out of cable. Or run over its cable and get tangled. <laughs> And so that in itself is a lot of fun. Um, I figured soon as I have this screen, I may as well do stuff with it. It was an impulse thing when I was buying the processor. I thought having a screen as well would look cool. So it's got a screen. At the moment it's running top, giving you some system diagnostics. <laughs> um, it's a frame buffer. Believe it or not, at one point I had X11 on there and I was running the Enlightenment window manager on the screen, but that's overkill, and you couldn't use it through the HDMI port then, so it's running a frame buffer. The Enlightenment project makes a terminal called Terminology that will quite happily launch onto a frame buffer, and so we can have top. The other joy of Linux is to control it. We can just SSH into it. And then we can kill top and we can start up webcam. And it is now, this webcam is now on and I'm using another Enlightenment group of applications called Rage, which is their mPlayer clone. But conveniently, that can also run on a frame buffer. And so now this webcam is looking at you and coming out on the screen. And as an intermediate stage, at one point, I was running VLC in ASCII mode on the terminal. So I can do that as well. So if we get this web camera, you can see that that is now a webcam with a webcam looking at itself. And so being Linux, um, I got to make the I got to make use of a wonderful thing called System D. So my I wrote some simple startup scripts and the robot will start up, application will start up automatically as a service and will keep running forever. And so there is that. How are we doing for time? So, in, so as a summary of what I've said, the main joy of open source is if you want to do something, you can look at all the things other people have done and you can go away and if you can come up with a way to glue them all together, you can make something complicated 
or something that's reasonably quite, quite complex with very minimal effort and you can do it yourself. So rather than thinking, I want to do this thing, I'll go write a new library for it, look at what's already out there by using modular designs with common protocols, you leave yourself open to be able to change things and you also make it easy for other people who come along, they might find your project and if you have an open protocol then they can connect their UI to your robot or um, for that and generally use the right tool for your job is always a good thing um, and build yourself a robot. There is kits out there for any sort of starter level. If you don't know how to program, there is robot kits that take block UIs that you can do stuff and you can have fun. If you're unlike me and you're really good at mechanical things, you can build yourself something mechanical and run someone else's software on it. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, quick look up a couple of quick thank yous. Thank you for Susa, who conveniently allowed me to make my trip to Europe align with this conference so I could come in funding my travel. Thank you to everyone who's organised the conference. And have you got any questions? Are you planning on uh, open sourcing the hardware design specs aspect and from a software perspective, have you got a project in OBS? I haven't got a project on OBS um, because that I'm a packager. I could put a project on OBS without much effort, but at the moment, because it's still in much more of a experimental stage, there's a project on GitHub and you would have to copy the things to the right place for your processor. In terms of the hardware, as I've showed you, it's quite simple. I've used two off-the-shelf hardware boards and an Arduino. And so the hardware designs in this slide are probably as complex as it gets. And so it's not like I've gone and designed something complicated. Had I designed both these boards rather than buying off the shelf ones then yes there probably would have been a case for me to open the hardware design. Is there anyone else? All right well thank you and I think we have a couple of minutes so feel free to come up have a look at it ask me any more questions. We can possibly drive it around the stage a little bit for a couple more minutes. Thank you. <laughs>